fortress that I've kind of designated here. We're going to need to dig a staircase down. That's where our fortress is actually going to be sited. Now, initially, I don't want them digging all of those pasture spaces out. That's a lot of digging, and it's not directed the way I want. So what I'll do is I'll designate the pasture space, and then I'll just cut it off. And with it cut off, the dwarves won't actually dig it out. They'll just skip it for now, unless they can reach it by some other way. And there's no other way into that pasture area, so they'll leave it undug and designated for later. You can actually designate your entire fortress, and then come back a little later and dig these out. Uh, for you folks there out there in chat box land, no, I don't use Fast Dwarf. Uh, I actually have never used Fast Dwarf ever. Um, I've used Auto Dump occasionally to fix problems, but I, I don't use Fast Dwarf. Uh, it effectively sets your dwarves to lightning speed, for those of you who aren't familiar with the DF hack command. Um, you can really use it to get a lot of work done in a very short time. I'm going to be playing this in real time, so those of you who are... Uh, time constraint, you're probably going to want to come back at some point and pick up the videos down the road, maybe fast forward through bits you don't care about. Now, eventually, when we're, when we're doing this, this first floor here underground is going to become our surface farms in the center, and the second floor underground is going to become our uh, underground farms. Now, one of the things you have to deal with, and I'm going to pull reveal up here a moment so I can kind of explain this with a little more picture. One of the things you have to deal with in Dwarf Fortress is the difference between stone and soil. This first level is soil. Uh, it doesn't leave any rocks behind when you dig it out, and it makes perfectly good crop land without having to do anything to it. I can grow crops on underground soil immediately as soon as I start. But I can't grow crops on underground stone. In order to grow on stone, you have to have mud, and this does not have mud by default. In order to get mud, we have to get the stone wet. Now, once it's gotten wet, it automatically has mud, and we can grow crops on it like normal, just like it was stone, or just like it was soil, with once it's been irrigated one time. You don't have to irrigate it repeatedly, just the once. So, we'll turn reveal off, because I don't need it for this purpose. It's just to show you the difference between the stone here and the soil on the level above. What we'll do is we'll actually take advantage of this pond directly to the north, uh, I will dig out from this room. And I'll dig a staircase. And now notice I'm not actually digging into the pond. I'm digging along the pond. Um, the reason is because I don't want the flooding to actually start until I'm ready for it. We're going to drain that pond down that staircase, through that hallway, and out into this room here. And once it covers this stone room, we'll be ready to actually, we'll get our mud and we'll be ready to do our farming. Um, additionally, I'm going to do one other neat little trick here. I'm going to get rid of a couple of sections of this to avoid a cave-in down the road. And I'll show you where that's going to be here in just a moment. That area right there that I just culled will actually use for, pl for farm plots. I'll actually dig it from up here. Um, but in order to do that, I need to clear any trees that are in that area. So just as with those trees down there, I'm going to need to clear some trees up here as well. Not many, but a couple are kind of in the way. So we're going to do a quick designate tree cutting. And we're going to clear these couple of trees that are right above where we're building. A couple of them are in the way of where I want stuff in the fortress to be dug out. Okay, with reveal off and our initial fortress build ready to go, we're ready to unpause again and get underway. Notice that dwarves, they left those trees and they immediately went up here. Dwarves tend to prefer, uh, dwarves tend to prefer jobs that are to the north and the west before they do jobs to the south and the east. It's not guaranteed, but if you give a, job, a dwarf a choice, the job that's further north or further west will be the ones that tend to get done first. So that's why they've vacated the earlier jobs and went after those. Uh, some of my viewers are asking about, uh, yes, cave-ins are a thing again, but it's actually fairly easy to avoid a cave-in. Uh, let's, let's cover that first. Um, this, let's, let's look over here down away from the fortress a minute. Let's say I dug out a square Say I dug this square out, only I didn't dig out the center. 
just that ring. If there was no support underneath, if I also dug out this room underneath, like this, what I would do is I would cut this, this floor, this first level floor, would be effectively floating if you want to picture it in your head. So I have a floor that I've told them to dig, it, dig a, cut a hole into, and then on the level below it, there's nothing holding it up because I've told them to dig it out underneath. Um, if you dig out large areas like this, you can cause a cave-in, and many miners will die. It's a very bad thing. Um, but as long as there's an orthogonal, i.e. north, south, east, west, only the four cardinal directions, orthogonal connection, you can uh, avoid cave-ins entirely. So, for example, uh, up here at the top, um, I'm going to dig out a section here. Now, notice that staircase area in the middle. If I dug out those areas there, and then I went down a floor and I dug out the areas here, and I didn't have the staircase, then we would actually end up with a cave-in. That central area would collapse and go down a floor, and potentially multiple floors, depending on what was underneath it. Um, because, however, there's a staircase there, it won't actually collapse. It will remain solid. So this will survive. Now I want to be careful because at this point I've told them to do it all at one time and conceivably they could cut it off before I was ready for them to dig it out before the staircase was in place to hold it up. So we're actually going to do one little quick check, one little quick change here to make sure that there's a fix for it. Notice that one little, that one little orthogonal connection. So this one tile here is connected north to this tile here and east to that tile there. This one little connection is all it takes to avoid a cave-in. One tile will hold up the entire world if you want it to. But if you cut that tile and there's nothing else holding it up, boom, everything collapses in. So be mindful of cave-ins, but they're not nearly the issue they used to be in earlier versions of Dwarf Fortress. Um, typically you won't see them. If you do, it's because you've designated way too much stuff in the wrong order. You've got your dwarves going willy-nilly everywhere, and you're not really taking the time to do it carefully. Um, we now have enough picks for our metalsmith. I've got a few trees that aren't yet cut, but we've got plenty of trees laying around here on the ground. Let's go ahead and get our miners mining. Uh, I do this with a custom profession. This is another reason why I love Dwarf Therapist, and I can't say it enough. My mine workers have multiple jobs and special customized profession names. And I touch them only once. I simply grab them, select that profession name, and presto, they're in. They do mechanics, i.e. they build traps and build mechanisms, and mining are the two jobs I've got them set up to do. Um, they also get called mine workers. So if I go back over to Dwarf Fortress and I pull up one of the screens you're going to see me use repeatedly, the units screen, you'll notice that all my miners are now called crafter mine worker. Now it, only, it abbreviates them because Dwarf Therapist won't actually, or Dwarf Fortress won't actually let you uh, show the entire name. It's too long. But this is enough for me to know that this guy is a crafter, i.e. somebody who could conceivably get a mood, and he would mood in mine working, i.e. mining. Um... This allows me to control, to my satisfaction, what jobs my dwarves are doing, know at a glance that this guy has mining and mechanics as his two skills, see what he's doing. You can watch, look at your pets and livestock. You can look at the wild animals you have, you've encountered on the map. Uh, the fire imps, for example, are probably way down in the volcano somewhere and safely away from us. There's a couple of great horned owls, a weasel, and an eagle. Um, nobody's died or nobody's died yet, but as Dwarf Fortress reminds us, the year is still young. Um, with this done, our dwarf, our miners will drop or finish up the jobs they're doing, drop their axes where they were, and immediately run off to get picks. Once they've got picks, they'll immediately start digging, and they'll carve out the area that I told them to carve out. Once they get the staircases dug back to the surface, I can go ahead and put that tile back in that we dug out earlier. But you'll notice that they've already started digging the lower level. There's no real good way to predict what dwarves will mine first. 
that's why you have to watch out for cave-ins. Um, it's possible that they do all the surface first, or that they dive to the bottom and do all of it first, or uh, just don't rely on your dwarves to do it right. That's a really bad idea. Notice that they didn't even finish that staircase, so he dug the bottom half of the staircase, but not the upper floor of it, so he didn't actually get the staircase for the flooding finished. Oh, crap. That, boys and girls, is what happens when a fire imp attacks an owl or an eagle or something flying over the top of the volcano. And that is an advancing firewall. Welcome to fun. This firewall will sweep over our wagon and vaporize everything it comes across. I've had this happen one time on this map previously, and this is going to get ugly fast. If the dwarves make it to the left side of the brook, the firewall will stop advancing. So if I can get them to stay up in this area up here, they'll survive. So much for easy tutorial land is right. This advancing firewall will literally burn the entire map. Nothing will survive on this left side. You could get them underground, but there's no way I'm going to get all of that equipment underground in any time reasonably quick. Um, one thing I could conceivably do is dig a trench. Uh, probably not before the firewall gets here, but it's possible you could theoretically do it, I guess. Um, well, hell. Alright, let's go for the trench method. That's right, will the brave dwarves survive the flaming wall of death? Hint, probably not. And for uh, for added bonus fun, our uh, our uh, uh, miners are busy getting themselves a drink right now, so they're not actually going to do any mining until they finish their booze. Chances are good they're not actually going to finish mining until well after we really need them. So at this point, everybody's a miner, and this is another reason why I love Dwarf Therapist. They're all miners right now. Um... We're going to try and dig this out. If I can get this trench dug and it's bare, I can get the fire to sweep past them and miss them, and they'll survive the, the, the fire. In fact, I'm going to move it out just a hair. Uh, yes, this will have to be a quick... This will have to be a quick uh, box. This single double wall will not survive them. The fire will sweep around and head back north if I don't cut the entire square. Let's see if they make it. Notice that the ramps have started growing grass. This is the other part of fun. Yes, the fire will sweep from this level down onto the ramp and back up. This is also not good. Cross your fingers. Oh, 
Lots of steam, lots of smoke. I think we're actually going to survive. Everything that is out there, the trees you might have noticed actually survive the brush fire. Everything else burns. If I have had my dwarves, I actually didn't see this coming at one point. I was in the middle of cutting wood. It happened very, very early. And by the time I realized there was a problem, the brush fire was already on them. And effectively, I got annihilated about two minutes in. This is actually bad, though, because, you know, it's really ugly. Okay, with the brush fire gone past at this point, it's now safe to let my dwarves out to go back to doing what we were doing. Oh yeah, I have to redesignate all that stuff because it got removed. Now, keep in mind, I've played on this map half a dozen or more times at least, and I've had this happen about twice. The first time was a total shocker. After that, I kind of figured out that I might need to watch out for it. So I've kind of been looking for the brush fire to happen every time I've played this map since. Uh, it doesn't happen every time. It depends on whether the fire imps decide they want to attack something on the edge. And if they do, well, then you get brush fire. And if they don't, then you don't have a problem. You'll notice the brush fire dies out at the brook. So uh, another way to survive would be to dig your fortress, say, for example, up here in this corner. It makes it impossible for the brush fire to ever get to you, uh, aside from anything you might leave behind at the wagon, of course. Okay, let's see then. Where were we? Oh yeah, we gotta dig out the top. And I want to turn off any mining that was being done by all these other folks, because I don't really want them doing mining. You'll notice they've gotten to be dabblers. They're level zero now. Um, for me, that's okay. They're not gonna mood mining accidentally because they all have higher skills than what their mining was. But something to be aware of is that you have to keep an eye on everything going on on your map whenever possible. Uh, the answer to what can't they survive is there are a lot of things dwarves can't survive. Just because I can get my dwarves through a brush fire does not mean that they will survive to see a population of 300. Okay, with this area dug out, we can now finish what we were doing down here. Clear out those last remaining ramps. But not the stairs. Now, you see that little green patch there on the north end of the stairs there? What's happened there is the surface up here, since it's channeled out, exposes that layer to sun. Effectively, I've converted those whole areas on the level below to be surface areas. So we'll actually be able to grow surface crops. Now, one of the weird things that you can really do uh, here is you can actually grow the surface crops on the level below after you put a floor back over these holes. Um, so what you'll end up with is a situation where I'm gonna grow surface crops underground because we're that good. Uh, our engravings probably won't even remember the fire because nobody died. If you had somebody die in the fire, then you'd probably get images of dwarves burning. Uh, there might very well be images of animals burning later on. I, we'll have to see once we start getting to the point where we're uh, doing things that will actually invoke the history, so to speak. Uh, we've mined out this area down below, so we're ready to actually punch a hole to the pond.
Now notice I'm doing this from above. That keeps my dwarf from drowning or getting flooded or, you know, getting pushed against a rock and, you know, busting his head open. Uh, believe me, I've had dwarves pushed down a ramp by a flow of water and break every bone in their body and die. Yeah, not only can you grow surface plants, but theoretically, if you hollowed out a big enough space and then floored it over, you could actually grow underground trees, uh, surface trees on the underground. Uh, I've never done it, but you could. Notice that the water floods out over the top of the surface here. Um, if I hit K to investigate the contents, you'll notice this dusting of mud that appears here. Dusting of mud is what you're looking for. That says that I will now be able to farm on that soil, on that stone surface that was not possible before. Once it's covered the entire area, and it will cover the whole square here before it's done, at this point we now have a problem. There's still plenty of water up here to come flooding down, and I don't really want to wait for three years for this to, uh, to uh, actually finish up. So what we're going to do is we're going to spread the water out so it evaporates more quickly, and to do that we're going to dig a small room off to one side. I'm going to go ahead and build a wall real quick here. My mason will come along momentarily, drag a rock over, and build a, a crude wall to dam up the uh, the pond so it doesn't bother us in the future. He couldn't actually finish. You'll notice the building site here is submerged. Uh, if, a wa if water depth is two or greater, it will cancel the job. Uh, you can actually unsuspend it eventually, as long as the water is not always above two. They'll work on it a little bit at a time, and eventually they'll get it done. So there, he finally completes the wall. All you have to do is unsuspend it and let it go. Um, for realism purposes, yes, as people notice, you could do glass or glass floors and treat them like it was a you know a greenhouse. Realistically, if you go out and you Google long enough, you'll eventually find uh, windows on various uh, ver these ornate carved windows that look like plates of stone that have had etching done to them until they have holes in them. And you could theoretically walk on them. I mean, they look pretty solid, but they effectively are grates that you could actually, you know, see through that would let light through. I suppose you could abstract the floors as that, too, if you really wanted to. Okay, now water will evaporate, and lava as well, but water for now, will evaporate at a level of one. So you can already see right here there's a couple of squares where the water level has gone down to one and then evaporated. If this two spreads out, it will become a one and a one, and eventually it will spread out far enough that it's just going to evaporate it completely. And I have to use solid for the record. I don't have nearly enough sand to make... Uh, 25 times 4 is 100 windows, is what, or 100 floor pieces is what I would need. I need 100 bags of sand. I don't have anywhere near that amount. So realism is, well, this is Dwarf Fortress. Uh, now, in the, in the excitement of our recent brush fire that left our animals nearly starving to death because there's only a limited pasture space and, you know, burned out all of our grass through the entire map, we actually forgot that our weaponsmith wasn't doing anything. We need to get him back to work. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have him build bronze serrated discs. And I'm going to put those on repeat. And I use these for a couple of different things. Um, first off, they're really good as trap components. They slice and dice goblins and pretty much anything. Um, but they're also highly valuable. Uh, a single bronze disc can be worth a couple thousand dwarf bucks. And so I brought with me two stones and a coal, and I'm going to convert them into a several thousand dwarf bucks disc. And I'm going to get four bronze discs per pair of stones, basically, at that point. Um, so this is a massively valuable trade good I'm getting ready to produce here. Now, I do need to mention uh, wealth has both good and adverse effects in this game. Uh, more wealth means you're more likely to see hostile invaders coming to take it away from you earlier on. It also means larger migrant waves, and it can cause you as it can cause you as much problem as it does good. So if you're starting out, one of the things you want to avoid early on is needless creation of wealth. Uh, I've done this a few times. I typically don't have my dwarves starve to death anymore. I think we can probably go ahead and get away with it. But if you're really new and you're trying to learn, this is probably a step you're going to want to skip for now, or or at least not do on repeat. Maybe you create a few discs and then move on. 
Additionally, uh, in the units screen, you'll notice that my dwarves are now showing, hey, I don't have anything to do. They're, they're not doing any tasks here. Um, we need to get our carpenter working. Uh, let's see, we need to create a few more beds. Oh, right, they burned up all the... Remember we had all that wood laying around? Yeah, not anymore. All you people who were laughing about uh, bringing... All you people who were laughing about bringing wood to a woods... Yeah, there's why you bring wood with you. Right there. Uh, the wooden axes they dropped probably got burned up. I'll probably have to make a few more of those. Uh, that's another good reason why you make extras. You never know what's going to happen to the items. If you have only enough, it's possible to end up with situations where you can't get them back. For example, if I had only one pick and my miner dug himself into a hole and then starved to death down there where nobody could reach him, you end up with a situation called uh, Digger Mortis, where you have no diggers to get back to the pick because your diggers can't use the pick that's in the hole. Bronze discs can be used for two primary purposes. The first, of course, is weapon traps. That's their primary purpose. Uh, they, they slice, they dice, they make julienne fries. And in addition to being used for their weapon trap purpose, they can also be sold to the caravan. They make very valuable trade goods. Um, one disc can be worth a couple thousand dwarf bucks of, of merchandise in trade. And since all of your trade is done in barter, the more valuable the things you produce, the more goods you can get back in return. So I may sell one disc and buy out all of the food on the caravan, for example, or several pieces of armor, or all of the bins and beds and cages and what who knows what all they'll bring with them this next time um along the way let's see we've got our first farm level we've got our second farm level let's see our miners need something to do our mason is not busy and our carpenter's not busy okay so here's what we're going to do we're going to have our carpenter handle his own wood cutting and we're going to have our mason start working on the conversion of stone into useful things. Yes, I am building a mason's workshop again, even though I already have one. Uh, the purpose is simply stone is very heavy. Your dwarves take a long time to move stone any reasonable length, so hauling the stone from down below all the way back to this mason's workshop is actually really, really inefficient. Uh, having it right at the top of the stairs there means it's a lot less distance for him to travel, and he'll make stuff faster. Okay, with our carpenter set up to do wood cutting, our miners need a task for themselves as well. While we're waiting for the flooding to kind of die back a little bit so I can continue the staircase further down, we're going to go ahead and dig out the first pasture area. Notice at the top right my idler count is zero. In these first few months, as your fortress really gets starting, uh, you're really going to want to keep your idle count low. Uh, zero, if possible, for the first few months. Uh, my mason has finished building his workshop, for example, but I didn't have any tasks in it for him, so he's gone back to being idle again, and I want to get him working as fast as possible. Uh, we're going to immediately convert him back into doing rock blocks for the time being, because we're going to need them for walls here in a bit. Now with our idler count back to zero, our flooding is just about dead now. We don't have any twos left moving around, so we're in good shape here. I'm going to go ahead and get a couple of farm plots built. Uh, now keep in mind, I build very large farm plots. I will eventually have to turn them off, or I will, I will literally drown in uh, crops. Um, you can get by with much smaller farms than this on a large population with skilled farmers. Uh, the advantage to doing large quantities like this is I can literally massively overproduce on demand. I don't have to worry about, oh, well, I don't have enough farm space to produce that quickly. Um, we're going to produce 
both underground and surface cropped hundred tiles of each of them available for cultivation at any given point. Uh, this is far, far more than you will ever need for any fortress you can even conceive of, uh, unless you're running on a hypothetical space computer. Uh, I don't think, uh, folks were asking about the difference between wooden and stone walls. I don't believe wooden walls burn. I've never actually tested it. I do know that wooden walls are not magma safe, but ice walls, I believe, are. Don't ask why. Yeah, I'm not sure if that actually applies to wooden walls. Frankly, if you're going to experiment with, you know, using wooden walls to hold back magma, yeah, you're you're experimenting at that point. That's not new player tutorial level. That's uh, messing around with the advanced physics of Dwarf Fortress. That's a little beyond our tutorial for tonight, I'm afraid. Um, you'll notice that this, this pasture space here is bare stone, uh, or bare soil, I should say. There's no... There's no plants growing in it. Uh, you can't actually pasture animals on bare soil, except for the pigs, which aren't grazers. Turkeys are not grazers. They'll survive on the, on the bare soil. But your sheep would die. They would actually starve to death. So uh, we'll actually have to, do a, we'll have to have to do something here to convert this soil space into a proper pasture before it's ready for use. But this gets it dug out and ready for us. And we can set up our first stockpiles here to use for temporary purposes momentarily. I'm going to dig out a space now since I ruined my uh, the space I would normally use on this map for milling. I can't use for milling because it just got a big trench dug into it in order to avoid our nasty fire problem earlier. So we'll do our mining or uh, milling area on a lower level floor uh, a little later on. Notice that our dwarves have gone, our miners have gone back to drink again. Dwarves drink regularly. Uh, booze is a very important thing. I'm going to pull up the stocks menu here, or the stocks overview with Z. The Z menu allows access to several submenus you're going to find really, really useful. Uh, one for monitoring animals, a second for monitoring the food stocks of your dwarves. Uh, third, for controlling how stones are used. You won't use that one very often, but it's there. And the stocks screen, which displays the contents of your fortress down to the unit. Notice that the question, some of this stuff is marked with question marks. That's because I don't have an accurate count of it yet. And I'll get into record keepers uh, for uh, monitoring this more closely later. But for now, suffice to say that the stock screen is useful for keeping track of how many bars, bricks, blocks, weapons, everything that you have. The stocks overview, this main page, is a general overview of the most important things you typically need to know at a glance. This tells me that I have roughly speaking somewhere between 40 and 50 booze. I have roughly between 40 and 50 fish. I have five plants. I don't have anything else here. No meat, some seeds, you get the gist. Um, typically speaking, you want to make sure you have lots and lots of booze. Running out of drink is very bad. Dwarves without booze slow down enormously. And that slowdown doesn't initially seem to be particularly dangerous. That's because you don't realize the, the efficiency penalty it creates on your fortress uh, going along. It, it basically, you can ignore it, not realize it's happening. And the next thing you know, you're planting a quarter of the food you used to plant because your dwarves don't have enough booze to keep them fueled. Uh, your miners aren't mining enough ore to keep your furnaces running. Your weaponsmiths aren't producing enough swords. Uh, people are crawling from point to point, so your traps don't get built on time. It, it, it's an insidious, insidious problem, and it will absolutely devastate your fortress. Okay, our miners are pretty much the only things that need a job at this point, so let's go ahead and start on the deeper floors. At this point, most of the flooding has receded completely. We'll end up with a slightly muddy staircase, but I think I can live with that.
we'll dig the staircase about 10 levels deep. Uh, remember, I've, I've adjusted this world so that we've got about 15 levels before we hit the first cavern, so no risk here. Um, we, we know that we're going to have at least 15 levels to play with. I'm nowhere near to 15 now, so we're in good shape. Okay, now let's start looking at what we're going to use these floors for. This is food production, this is food production. This is probably a good place to put food storage. We'll make this one into stone cutting so that we have a place for our mason to actually get to work underground. And if I pull the Z menu up, you'll notice it's now late spring. Before much longer, we're going to start to get our first migration wave. Uh, because of the volume of wealth we are producing, uh, we will get a fairly sizable wave for these first couple of waves, and then we will probably get an enormous wave at about the third or fourth wave. Notice these cancellations for damp stone. Uh, that's because on the level above this, you'll see it keep recentering me, because that's what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about the difference between pause and recenter. Um... All those ones count as water, and so all of the all of the stone underneath them count as uh, damp, and it will actually cancel any digging jobs on damp soil for fear that your dwarves are accidentally going to flood your fortress on you. Um, you can force them to dig through damp stone, and they will happily flood your fortress for you if you want, but if you just mark an area and they come across it, they will stop. They won't go any further. They won't actually endanger your fortress by themselves. Okay, now let's cover a slightly more advanced topic than anything we've talked about so far. Let's talk about stockpile logistics chains. This is a really deep topic, and it causes a lot of problems for the folks who've posted about it on the Reddit thread. I see on Reddit threads, I see this all the time. People complaining that dwarves can't haul for shit, that they are ass backwards stupid when it comes to handling seeds and planting and gathering up uh, seeds from the dining room that they take the barrels on long runs and they end up not being able to plant and it brings the fortress to ruin. I'm going to show you how to fix it. And it requires just a little bit of basic setup on your part and then it runs flawlessly from then on in. And the way you do it is you set up a stockpile logistics chain. I'm going to quickly build three stockpiles and designate them and then I'll explain what I've done and why. Okay, this gets a little bit more complicated, so bear with me and I'll try and explain. We have all these farm plots here where we'll grow crops. This center stockpile will take from any place. It only holds plants. So if I go in here to the settings, I've, the only thing I've got is plants, and the only plants I've got it taking are underground plants. It won't take surface plants. So your dwarves will pick a crop and drop it in this stockpile, and they'll use that as a temporary... Uh, storage room, and later on we'll get them to move it down here to where we're going to have the final food storage for it. Now, at some point, Eurus McHungry goes and grabs himself a plump helmet from the food storage, drags it off to the dining room, eats it, and leaves a seed behind. And what happens in a lot of fortresses is your dwarves come along and go, Oh, look, a seed! And they immediately run upstairs and grab the barrel full of seeds, and then they take it downstairs, and they scoop up all the seeds, and then they run back upstairs and drop the barrel off. And the problem is, is that they take all the seeds in the fortress when they move the one barrel. And while they're running the barrel all the way down to the dining room and back, nobody else can plant any crops, which leads to all these cancel spam messages about, 
oh my god, how do we get plant, how we can't plant anything, there's no seeds in the fortress. Well, there are seeds, just that this Eurus McStupid is hauling the barrel all the way down to the dining room and back. So we fix that by having two stockpiles. We have an outer stockpile, which takes seeds, and again, only from the underground plants, and only seeds, no barrels, and is set to take from anywhere. This will actually cause Eurus McStupid to get Eurus McSmart all of a sudden, and he'll run down to the dining room, pick up the single seed that was left, drag it back upstairs, and drop it off in this stockpile. This inner stockpile, which takes barrels, but only takes from links, notice the only from links here, and barrels, is used as a permanent seed storage. This is where our seeds will actually be stored. So this, this, di this seed comes from the dining room, it lands in the outer stockpile, and then somebody comes along and picks it up from the outer stockpile and moves it two steps and puts it in a barrel. The seeds are still getting stored in the barrels, in the bags, but you don't get the problem where the barrel goes AWOL and nobody can plant your crops. Since that problem can, in larger fortresses, result in massive food shortages, this is actually a much bigger topic than it first appears, and it seems very simple to just throw up a stockpile and let them do it, and they will. And you can even do it and get away with it as long as you have more than enough food or you're producing lots of food from meat and fish and other sources, but it can put a serious crimp in your farming. Now, up here on the upper floor, I'm going to build the same type of setup, the same type of stockpile logistics chain, only I'm going to build it for the surface plant area up here. And I'm going to walk through it a little more slowly so you can kind of follow along. First, we build an inner stockpile, which will hold our plants. Next, we build the middle stockpile, which will hold barrels and seeds. Last, we build the outer stockpile, which will only hold seeds, but no barrels. We set the outer stockpile to give to the middle stockpile. We set the middle stockpile to take barrels and only take from links. And then we set which each stockpile is allowed to actually use. So the inner stockpile is plants only. I change the settings by disabling animals, enabling food, blocking all types. We go down to plants, we move over. I go down to the surface plants and I mark all surface plants not dimple cups, all surface plants viable. So only surface plants will get stored in this inner stockpile. And that means that the far crops that are grown here move two steps and drop in the temporary stockpile. Some other hauler will come along later on, some peasant that we don't care about, and he'll move that, that plant from this stockpile to the other stockpile. But for now, that keeps your farmer moving only about two steps to drop his stuff off. So he's moving back and forth. He's moving from, from here, dropping a plant, and then he's moving down here and picking up a seed, and he's coming right back and planting, and then he's coming back here and picking up a seed, and he's moving right here and he's planting, and then he goes here, bang, 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 bang. You use the G key for give and the T key for take, and you can set it up either way. You can set this one to take from this one or this one to give to that one. They both do the same thing. You'll notice here in the bottom it's marked as take, and down here it's marked as give. Now, I haven't changed the settings, so there's, they're showing up as animal stockpiles right now. Again, we go into the settings, we disable animals, we enable food, we block all types, we go down to seeds in this case, and I set only the surface seeds. This is now a seed stockpile. This one is still an animal stockpile, we change it the same way. We disable animals, we enable food, we block all types, we go into seeds, we change only the surface seeds. Now we have seeds dropped here that are stored in barrels here, that are planted in farms there, that are dropped off here when they're harvested, and you have set them up as a chain effectively this is a, this is an organized logistics chain your your dwarves will smartly move items from one to the next to the next to the next and it will make them not only intelligent about organizing their gear but also efficient in terms of how they deal with things um, if we have plants and i think we still in our wagon we still have five plump helmets sitting up there that we brought with us the first thing that's going to happen is dwarves will immediately move them to this stockpile if they have food hauling. I think I think our farmer probably has food hauling still set on him, and he'll move a plump helmet down here and drop it in the temporary stockpile. You'll notice that they're dropping seeds off the seed bags in the outer stockpile. Then they're moving them to the inner, the middle stockpile, where they'll eventually reside with barrels. 
there's a little bit of weirdness here at the beginning when they first start moving the bags around, but they eventually get the bags to where you want them, and then you don't ever have to worry about it ever again. It's, it's taken care of at that point. Now down here on this next floor, we're going to create the, the master food stockpile. This is where we're going to store uh, our food in barrels, basically. Now this will take all types of food except I don't allow prepare, unprepared fish. I'll get into that later. I don't allow eggs. I'll get into that later. Um, I don't get into... Uh, there's some other things here. Prepared food I don't allow. Uh, there's a few types of extracts. Not that I'm probably going to make any of them, but I don't allow those. Uh, I don't allow any of the default animal extracts or lye. Uh, there's a couple of non-food type items that end up in this collection if you're not careful um i omit those entirely so and all seeds because we've got stockpiles for seeds built already so at that point you don't need to store seeds here uh we're also eventually not going to store drinks in this spot so i don't want them here we will however store all of these other types i think that's pretty much got it at this point. So remember, I've turned off all that stuff, and the reason we do that is because now we set this stockpile to take only from links, to use barrels, and to take from those temporary stockpiles, both of them. And so what we've done now is we've extended the chain, and so plants will get produced, dropped in this stockpile, some hauler will come along and move them down to the main stockpile where they will reside until we, re until we need them. Uh, for those of you asking about uh, the, the setting cheese from plants here, there are no types currently of cheese that are plant-based, but there's nothing that stops you from modifying, uh, modifying your game to create plant-based cheeses, for example. Um, you, you theoretically could have your cheese growing on trees. Uh, Dwarf Fortress's raw files, which I didn't really get into before we got started tonight, are highly, highly detailed and incredibly modular. You can build new animals, new types of critters. You can give your dwarves three arms. Uh, it really does allow you to get away with a lot of, of tweaking and poking if you really want to do something really strange. You can build new types of workshops and new types of reactions, and you can have your dwarves convert uh, uh, pitch blend into plutonium and then sell it, tell, the, tell everybody that the plutonium is made into weapon traps. Or it's, There's all kinds of crazy stuff you can do. Okay, with our main food stockpile set up, one thing we haven't really done is, right now it, it's, it's holding all of those, but it's only taken from links, remember. So we set this up to, um, to take all food. So, for example, meat. But we don't actually have any other stockpiles to feed into this one for meat. Well, what we'll end up doing, and we're not really ready yet, but I'm going to go ahead and get it set up for later, is we'll use this pasture area to produce our meat, and we'll move the meat from here and a, st and a temporary stockpile from here down to the main stockpile. So we'll go ahead and build a workshop, a butcher's shop, in this spot. And notice that our mason has been busy and we now have lots and lots of blocks available. Generally speaking, I try to build my workshops from blocks. And the reason is because blocks are lighter and easier to move. There's no advantage to building them from stone or versus blocks other than value. Blocks are more valuable and speed. Your dwarves can move a block from point A to point B faster than they can move the rock. So we'll go ahead and build a butcher's workshop here. We'll build a tanner's workshop over here. We'll build a couple of farmer's workshops for producing milk and cheese. Um, at that point, we've got our animal production area is set up, but not quite ready just yet. In order to make all this work smoothly, we still have to build a couple of quickie stockpiles. And the first one we're going to need to build is a, a meat stockpile. And the second one is we're going to want to build a uh, cheese stockpile. Incidentally, you can't actually permit plant cheese. I can't actually turn that on, even if I wanted to. There's no types within that subcategory. So only animal cheese is what we'll turn on for right now. 
You cannot make tools and furniture out of blocks. Somebody asked if you can do that. No, blocks are only suitable for construction. So the downside of making blocks is that you've effectively you've effectively obligated yourself to only build workshops or walls or bridges or other constructions out of them. Uh, if you're making tools and furniture, they have to be made out of the raw stones, the actual boulders. Um, you won't typically run into a lack of stones. Uh, you look at this, this is the first floor. I could go down 10 floors of solid stone. I'm going to have more than enough stones to make whatever I want out of stone. Uh, later on, I'll actually show you they made a change to, Tony made a change to uh, how gem cutting works. You can actually make gem uh, carved stones into effectively gems and encrust items with bits of carved stone um, like you would out of rubies or diamonds or emeralds in older versions. Now, these temporary stockpiles will take from anywhere, but they're going to give to our main food stockpile down here on the lower level. This will allow us a spot that will take up cheese, and this will allow us a spot that will take up meat, and then they will both give to that uh, main stockpile. Okay, so we've got our butcher's area set up. We've got it taking taking meat from the butchery, dropping it in a stockpile right next door, and then from that stockpile down into the main stockpile down below. That takes care of the, the, the main food groups that we're going to deal with initially. We also have fish, but we're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, with our area down here walled off, now it's time to start talking about some of the more exotic things I like to do. And one of those is, in fact, fishing. Now, one trick you have to be aware of when you do fishing is it only helps if you're fishing in natural bodies of water. Sometimes on some maps you can get lucky and fish stuff out of things that aren't really rivers or brooks, but generally speaking I don't get as much luck out of them as if I'm fishing out of the real natural bodies of water. Uh, it's got to do with biomes and some other things behind the scenes that you can't actually see, but the net result is, is that the easiest way to set up fishing is to connect your stuff to the surface, and let your, let your dwarves do their fishing there. Uh, we will do that by making a tunnel to where we want them to be. Notice the extra tail on the bricks over there? That's a mistake. And you can cancel constructions by queuing over them and hitting X. Since the construction hasn't actually been built, it just goes away. It stops using the stone that it would get, and you're in business. Now, what we're going to do here is our miners will come along, dig out that new fishing tunnel that we just created. Uh, all the way up here to the surface, they'll punch a hole in the brook, our mason will get busy building a wall around it, and we'll wall it in. And we'll effectively have a small pillbox which is, has access to the brook, and you can actually build, you can build over water, but you have to be careful. This is a brook, not a river. Brooks have a walkable surface. Your dwarves could literally walk across this brook and back and forth and it wouldn't hurt anything. You can't walk across the river. When you build over a uh, uh, over a river, you basically have to build a floor out across the river and then build a wall up around it first. This, because it's a brook, I can get away with doing the way I'm doing. Uh, just keep in mind, if you try to build a wall and there's no floor underneath it, you end up with a problem. Yes, you can fish through the walkable surface. I like to put a grate over it. It's just personal preference. Um, I'm actually going to build floors over the top of the uh, brook and the two ground segments that are there. Yeah, it's just an aesthetics thing. It's not actually a mechanics issue. Um, one thing we are going to have to build at some point, and we're going to go ahead and do it now, is a ramp so that we can get up top and build a ceiling on our little pillbox here. Okay, and we'll let that run. And the dwarves will immediately go off and start their mining, digging out our fishing area, you know, chunking in from both sides, 
they'll get that done. Meanwhile, our mason will get started on... Uh, where is he? Oh, he's helping migrate stuff, apparently. He's still building blocks. Well, we want to temporarily stop him, so here's what we're going to do. Right there, you can see he has an active job making blocks. I'm suspending that job. Effective immediately, no more blocks are created until I tell him otherwise. And he's gone to get a drink. Of course he has. Of course he has. Oh, and uh, remember our fire earlier? I think I found our culprit. Yeah, yeah. That's what happens when a great horned owl gets a little too close to the fire imps. And we have finished our first season. And it only took us two hours and 45 minutes worth of tutorial to get to this point. Subsequent seasons will go a little faster. Uh, the big fire started, I think, and I don't know because it doesn't actually give me a, a combat message, but I think the fire imps attacked an owl. Uh, earlier I pointed out to... I pointed out to the folks who were watching that I had fire imps on the map. They showed up on the unit list. And somewhere around the way, all of a sudden, there's a giant brush fire coming my way. Gamelog.txt might tell us, but I noticed that there's no announcement over here for combat. So, well, because when the flaming bird lands on the ground, it ignites a brush fire. And the brush fire doesn't have any limits. It just spreads and spreads and spreads and spreads. Now, I don't know whether that's because the bird fell in and splashed a magma cloud up everywhere, or whether it's because the fire imp hit a bird that was perched on the edge and set everything on fire that way. I'm not sure exactly what set of conditions. I can bounce out real fast and see what game log text tells us, but my guess is it won't tell us what we want, what we want to know. Five megs where the game... yeah... thinking this is another... Yeah, this is our old... Gotta go all the way to the bottom and go back up. That's our older fortress. Let's see here. See, I don't have any message here about a combat between the owl and the fire imps, so I'm kind of speculating that, that that's what it is. Uh, here's where we're starting our new outpost. So this is this is all of the history we've managed to put together at this point. Only announcements get recorded here, and since I didn't get an announcement about it, it's not here. It doesn't exist. Um, this is this is our world being created right here. This is the tail end of it. Flat volcano all the way through the end. There's no announcement here that I'm seeing about you know an owl getting flam flambéed, for example. Yet if I go over there. Suddenly, he's in the deceased menu. It's possible, I suppose, that the fire imps paid a visit to the surface. It's possible that the owl's stupid enough to fly into the magma, get set on fire, and then go, Oh my god, I gotta get out of the lava and land somewhere. Suffice to say, if you do start on this map, you've gotta watch out for the potential that you could get this brush fire. I've played on it half a dozen, eight, ten, I don't remember how many times at this point. I've seen the brush fire twice. I've only died to it once. Um, the first time was kind of a shocker. Uh, Esco, uh, somebody link Esco the, uh, Reddit thread for me, would you guys? Um, Esco, I posted the, the lead into this Let's Play, this tutorial, out there on a Reddit thread, uh, along with my Embark profile and World Gen Tech settings. The World Gen Tech settings listed in there are the default settings for this. The initial... Embark site that we are on, this particular map, is available, if you watch the first part of this video, either on Twitch or later on YouTube, it'll show you where I'm embarking, so you can come back to this exact map if you want. Um, typically, it's not quite this fun, so, you know, you, you kind of have to bear with me. This was sort of, that was sort of an unexpected, uh, enjoyable event, shall we say. And our mason is now moving stone blocks over. Jobs, generally speaking, are created in a last-in, first-out order. The last job you create is the first job that gets done. So, for example, 
my ramp was the last thing I did. The mason builds it first. Uh, my YouTube thread for those of you who are, or my YouTube channel for those of you who are asking, um, I'll link it out on the Reddit thread later um, until I actually get.